And our today's lecture is on adaptive RT with MRI Linux. Our speakers are Dr. Lucas Whitsom and Yu Gao. They are both clinical assistant professors at Stanford. Uh, Lucas uh, joined Stanford in 2020 after completing his residency at UCSD. And he specializes in treatment of uh, GI and thoracic cancers and leading the program for uh, MAR guided as well as PET guided radiotherapy. And Dr. Yu Gao has joined Stanford last year after finishing her residency at UCLA. And at UCLA, she acquired a lot of great experience of using MR Linux and brought this great experience to Stanford. Uh, now she is one of the key physicists for MR Linux service. Uh, she has also recently became the Associate Medical Physics Residency Director at Stanford. So congratulations, you. So this talk is divided into two parts, a physician's perspective and physicist's perspective. So Lucas will start with the physician perspective on a MAR guided RT. And I will stop sharing. Go ahead, Lucas. Yeah, thank you, Natalia. And it's a uh... Fitting that, unfortunately, I have a case going on right now. So um, I am going to do my portion, and then um, I'll step away for a little bit, but then hopefully I'll be able to come back at the end for any questions. Um, so excited uh, to talk with you all about our experience with MR-guided um, radiotherapy. Um, so for the outline, I'll uh, start off by talking about my perspective as a physician and the rationale, why we think this is uh, a technology worth pursuing, and some overview of the system we use, which is the um, V-Ray Meridian system, um, and then some new clinical evidence. I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Gao, who'll talk about things from a physics perspective. You may have heard, too, this is an interesting time to be giving this talk because the company V-Ray is actually, unfortunately, um, went bankrupt and uh, is currently kind of figuring out what the future will hold and we're definitely, uh, I can hopefully make the case today that we're believers in the technology. I think that the technology is sound. Um, there's clearly some financial things going on with the, the company, but we're really hopeful that uh, we can find a way forward. So we can make the case for that today. Um, so why MR guided radiation? I think there's uh, three main um, benefits to this technology. Um, better soft tissue resolution and the ability for adaptation, um, and then using this as a motion management solution. Um, so for better soft tissue imaging, I think the um, really the picture and videos tell a thousand words here that you can see in the upper left, this is a CT, um, diagnostic CT with contrast. Um, and then on the right here, this is what actually like the, the um, imaging on the system looks like. And we compare that to a, uh, a CT cone beam and um, the for something that's soft tissue in um, the setting of other soft tissues, like up in the upper abdomen, um, lower abdomen or pelvis, you can really just see the stark contrast before these. And there's some things that I think we don't really need a um, randomized trial to see the benefit of this. And I think these uh, pictures um, are helpful and just really showing not only how well we can see the tumor, but also the organs at risk, which might be even more important. Um, so the ability to adapt, this really is just uh, secondary uh, to that ability to see the tumor so much better. Um, so this is a tumor in the body and tail of pancreas. You can see here uh, this part of the um, duodenum, uh, the third and fourth portion, how close that is to the tumor. Um, and then these are uh, just uh, scans from the day-to-day. Uh, -day. And, and there's just this inherent issue of we're trying to get 50 gray. Uh, to the primary tumors is a disease site where we think there is some benefit for dose escalation um, to trying to get a BED over 100. Um, and then we have other organs like the small bowel um, and stomach that are very radius sensitive, particularly to high dose maxes for risk of ulceration or perforation. So we're trying to get 50 gray immediately adjacent to a structure of con or with a rate of constraints of trying to get a point max less than 38 or a half cc less than 33. So um, just some inherent challenges here that I think uh, is really impossible to meet without some form of adaptation in an area like the um, upper abdomen where you have things changing so much from day to day. And then finally, um, the use case here is uh, motion management. 
um, the technology offers. Um, so we start uh, with getting an uh, image of the day in 3D, but then also we image during treatment. And this is a sped up version of seeing the patient um, breathe in and out. And we go through the workflow, but you can just see here that uh, it's a gating based treatment. So we can um, turn the beam on and off uh, when they're at the correct level of breath hold. And um, importantly, it's not using a fiducial or um, some surface guidance to, to determine when the tumor is. It's actually imaging the tumor directly, um, which I think has a lot of benefits over other surrogate markers. Um, so there's some disadvantages to this approach. Well, there's um, several here that we'll go through. So um, one is that it's a small bore size. So there's patients, just their body habitus might not allow it. Um, but then there's also claustrophobia. I actually just had a patient um, yesterday that wasn't able to, even with um, benzodiazepine medication, not able to uh, withstand it. So I'd say this has been less than 5% of patients that have uh, claustrophobia. Um, and importantly, we usually know about that ahead of time. So patients, you know, have gotten oftentimes diagnostic MRIs. Um, so they got a sense of if they're claustrophobic. Um, there are MR safety considerations. Some patients are just not eligible um, based on implantable equipment like a pacemaker um, or uh, metal in their body. Um, but and then it is just more burdensome to go through that. Uh, the treatment time is longer. Um, uh, up to hour and a half or longer for adaptation um, and for non-adaptive, um, you know, 40 minutes to an hour potentially. Um, another disadvantage is that it's step and shoot IMRT. So compared to some um, nice um, hyperarch plans or, or VMAT, it might not be quite as conform. Although um, I will say I have been uh, pleasantly surprised by how, how good the, the plans have looked. Um, we want to make this interactive. Um, feel free to just uh, shout out or put it in the chat. Oh, oh we have it interactive. So uh, which um, one is not um, an ad advantage of the MR Linux? So I agree with the majority here. So the key thing is like not the advantage of the disadvantage is um, it's not really good for high throughput. Um, we're doing, again, scheduling these patients for an hour to two hours. So this is really isn't like a, a heavy workforce machine. Which, um, unfortunately, it's part of the reason why the, uh, the company had financial difficulties because it really is more like a, a procedure, like something our uh, colleagues in um, surgery or other interventional procedures would do um, compared to uh, our, our standard treatments where we can just kind of line them up and treat. Okay, so a brief overview of what the system actually entails. Um, so the LINAC um, is a, a six megavoltage flattening filter free beam um, with a dose rate of 600 centigrade per minute and a three degree of freedom couch. Um, the lack of six degree of freedom, which we have in some of our other machines, really isn't an issue because, again, small differences in setup, um, we're not too concerned about because we're actually just making that up for in um, adaptation. So we actually, uh, compared to other um, SBRT or, or radius surgery plans, where we put uh, you know a lot of effort into immobilization, making sure that's really high quality, um, that we're less concerned with that because Oftentimes they're going to adapt anyway, um, so getting the position exactly right isn't isn't as important. And um, as we mentioned, it's step and shoot um, IMRT. There's some difficulty with imaging while the machine moves, and so it's an inherent limitation of the system that, uh, at least for the time being, there's really no foreseeable workaround from. Um, the MRI, uh, it's a clever engineering problem for how to figure out how to image something. Um, in a coil and actually deliver radiation at the time. So you can see it's this um, split magnet um, where the LINAC actually comes through and treats here. Uh, it's a relatively lower um, strength, a 0.3 Tesla, um, which the other main manufacturer um, is Electa and um, kind of oftentimes um, quotes that as 
a advantage of their system and thinking really there's there's pros and cons to the high and low magnetic strength um for uh doing our daily imaging it's actually pretty good um and that i've also heard from my colleagues in um, physics that there's less distortion compared to the higher uh magnetic fields particularly in the lung where there's the air tissue interface so um this one actually uh we're all able to do lung tumors um, where I've heard that's a, a challenge with the higher magnetic strength. And then it uses this called a TRUFI um, sequence. It's a hybrid of uh, T2 and T1 images. It's a more highly processed signal at lower strength. Um, and again, for most things like adaptation, um, it's been sufficient. This isn't something that I really think could like function as a diagnostic MRI in our department, um, although it does have the capabilities to do other sequences, um, just the, the lower field strength um, kind of limits its ability to replace what we use a diagnostic MRI or you know, something like brain maps. Um, so the uh, image guidance here, you can see a little bit more um, detail on the system. So it takes a 3D scan for image verification. Um, we do this at the start of each treatment, and then we can align it in 3D space. Um, and then actually during treatment, it's uh, guided using this uh, cine um, and the sagittal slice here. So uh, there's mounting clinical evidence for this, that even you know, if a technology has been around for like 10 years, um, the uh, there's been a pretty active user group you can see here throughout the world that is starting to um, accumulate some pretty uh, interesting data to support this technology. Um, there's two trials that I'll highlight, one for pancreas um, and one for prostate. Um, I'm a, a GI doctor, so we'll start with the pancreas trial. This is something that was actually just published um, last week, and they call it the SMART trial. Um, SMART here is an acronym for stereotactic MR-guided adaptive RT. And it was a prospective um, non-randomized trial that treated patients with SABRE. They included 60% um, with locally advanced, meaning th people that you know, were probably never going to go to surgery, 40% that um, were borderline, the possibility to go to surgery um, eventually. They all got induction chemotherapy with fulfirinox or gemabraxane, um, and then were treated on SMART. The prescription was for 50 gray and five fractions. They did allow for some elective um, nodal uh, coverage, but that was not specified, really just up to the treating physician. Um, and then found that when they did this, actually 93% um, of these fractions underwent adaption. So the vast majority um, underwent, um, felt the need where when they lined up the patient, looked at what the dose would like if you just treated the plant from SIM, um, and 90% of the cases decided that uh, it was worth pursuing the adaptation. So again, it's a non-randomized trial um, with the primary endpoint of the rate of grade three toxicity um, attributed to SMART within 90 days. Um, and it met their pre-specified endpoint of, um, of less than 10%, uh, so it was 8.8% at 90 days, which is um, pretty impressive for giving 50 gray um, to the abdomen. But we'll say there, you know, this is an error where certainly toxicities can occur later. Um, However, it's pretty uh, encouraging to have um, such a, a low rate, um, even just three months afterwards. Um, they also looked at the post-op grade three toxicity. So the patients, 44 patients that did go to surgery um, and did have a rate of high-grade toxicity for, of 20%, including three deaths. And all the deaths occurred in patients that had involvement of the um, vascular structures, either uh, the um, portal vein, superior mesenteric vein, um, celiac arteries or hepatic arteries. Um, but actually, if you, even if you look at a series of cases that uh, never got radiation, there's some pretty similar numbers of um, toxicity. But nevertheless, this is still an area where I think the optimal treatment's unknown um, for how to combine radiation and surgery for patients that do have involvement in the vasculature that go on to have surgery. Um, but very impressive results of uh, one year survival after 65%, um, which for you know a devastating disease like pancreas cancer is unfortunately pretty good. And then also very impressive local control rates of 80%. Um, and importantly, this is after the radiation too. So this isn't time from diagnosis. This is patients that um, already had chemotherapy um, and then went under radiation. 
The other trial um, that uh, gives some supporting evidence for MR guided radiation um, on the V-ray system is the Mirage trial. This is a actually randomized uh, phase three trial out of um, UCLA by Dr. Kishan. Um, that was published in the JAM Oncology this year. So they compared patients treated with five fraction prostate espiritine in 40, uh, with 40 grain five fractions and looked at the um, uh, standard LINAC based treatment um, with KV imaging or the MR guidance. The other difference between these two arms is that the MR guidance um, did shorter or smaller margins with two millimeters as opposed to four millimeters for the KV guidance. And some of these just as a, a you know, um, criticism of the trial saying, well, it's really a margin trial, not a um, trial of the two technologies. But I think it is fair in that, you know, the investigators say, well, we weren't comfortable dropping the margin that small without using this technology. Um, and uh, for results, the primary outcome was toxicity for GI and GU. I actually didn't find, did find in fact that the um, lower GI toxicity when patients were treated on with the MR guidance and smaller margins, um, a uh, rate of grade two or higher was zero versus 10%. Um, and the rate of uh, grade two or higher GU toxicity um, was decreased 20 to 40%. Um, and this was physician assessed, but then also actually when they looked at patient reported outcomes, um, which I think is a very important endpoint as well, um, saw that uh, um, that was actually improved um, for in the short term um, with the MR guidance uh, in for the GI as well as GU. Um, this is actually, uh, I think, change practice for our doctors here that now this is um, our, has been our preferred way to do prostate saver and actually even without um, doing the hydrogel, so the space OAR, um, I think our uh, doctors felt a lot more comfortable um, treating without that, you know, eliminating that invasive procedure for patients going prostate SPRT. Um, so who's eligible? Um, it's kind of a combination of who we think is an ideal candidate and eligible. So who we're using it the most on is for um, SPRT in the abdomen or pelvis, so including the um, pancreas, kidneys, or prostate, um, central lung as well. Um, any lung tumor over a centimeter in theory, like as long as it's big and solid enough to see it, could be a candidate, but it's really just kind of thinking, you know, who uh, is likely to benefit. And it's the central ones, particularly ultra central, where you're trying to get that really sharp dose gradient between the proximal bronchial tree um, and the tumor, where we think there's potentially a benefit of putting patients through these extra steps. Um, uh, outside of SBRT, um, you can do conventional fractionation in cases where, um, really the image guidance uh, we think would be very helpful. In theory, you could do adaptive on every treatment, um, but it's just pretty burdensome on the machine. It's a long time for the patient. Um, so in general, we haven't been doing daily, daily adaptation, but I think there's advantage uh, to just using the image guidance. We've had a couple of cases we've used that. Um, and then finally, since it uh, is step and shoot IMRT, this is something um, that you could do a 3D plan with. So at least in the US, or oftentimes we're constrained by what the insurance companies allows us to do. Um, this can uh, be done with a um, 3D uh, radiation plan or technology. Um, who can't we treat um, uh, very large tumors over 24 centimeters in length? Um, if it's um, off axis, that can be challenging. So we're centim seven centimeters from ISO center. Um, the claustrophobia we talked about, um, and then uh, patients that aren't able to hold their breath for long periods of time. Um, it is a gating-based treatment. We're typically doing this on inspiratory breath hold. Haven't had a lot of patients be excluded for this reason. Um, the vast majority have been able to hold it um, for the scans, um, but there are some that have really poor respiratory function, and they might not be able to. Um, if there's any contraindications, just getting the MRI. Um, and then if their uh, weight is above what the couch can handle. All right, we've got another question here. Um, so which of the patients uh, um, could be treated on the MRI linear accelerator?
So yeah, a lot of points to this one. Um, in this case, it actually be the prostate um, patient. So the titanium um, non-ferromagnetic we uh, could treat um, on the, the V-ray system. Um, the pancreas cancer, uh, we treat a lot of pancreas cancer. I think it's one of the best few cases, but, it, but you do have to be able to hold your breath. Um, uh, the C, that one was too big. And then um, for D, uh, that one would exceed our weight limit. Um, so we've been treating for almost a year now. Um, and this is kind of a breakdown of what we've been using it for. You can see here, vast majority um, is SPRT um, with some IMRT and then just a little bit of 3D radiation. And then for treatment sites, um, uh, volume, um, the prostate is our biggest, followed by pancreas, liver, um, and then some other uh, upper abdominal ones. So things like um, lymph nodes, cholangios, um, and adrenal glands. And now I will 